well, folks, um, Zoom has made some updates and they're very confusing, at least for old dogs like me, but I think we've got everything as it should be for tonight. Um, welcome back and welcome. I think we have some new names on the roster this evening. Um, we've got a whole hour and maybe even a little extra um, uh, bit of nature news to share with you this evening. Uh, I just um, tinkered a little bit with the angle on the screen here and I see now you can see what is some of my personal nature news for um, this past week. Uh, this is a silver maple. It's a ginormous, um, the official scientific term, the, the trunk. It has a single trunk that goes up not very high, maybe three or four feet. It splits off into all these other um, very, very large branches. And um, I was getting kind of nervous about it. Uh, someday splitting it, it could probably take out, you know, four houses if it actually, you know, were to split and go in a bunch of different directions. So uh, a couple months ago, I had some cables put in to secure things and the, the, the larger uh, branches are secured, but the smaller ones, and by smaller, I mean that, that branch right there is probably about like this, close to 15 inches where it attached to the tree. It uh, fell down one boom the other night. Um, but boy, it it split. It came right in between um, my house and my neighbor's house. And so far, anyway, we have not seen any damage uh, to either house. Um, fence is going to need some repair. <laughs> and uh, tech support puppy was one of the first ones to realize that the fence is down. Um, he got to use his climb command to climb on the branch and take a little walk about there in between. Um, working on getting that fixed, but I guess we'll just have to, I, I can't really block that the whole night, but boy, it's gonna bother me until we get that uh, cleaned up there. Anyway, um, as I said, we've got lots of things to share. I don't know, can everybody hear, we've got um, indications here of birds still breeding, even though we're here in the middle of July. Some of the birds that do raise um, two broods uh, and sometimes three, I think our robins have been known to now be able to crank out up to three broods in the season up here uh, in northern Illinois. But we've got we've got a cardinal doing his cheer, cheer, cheer. Um, as I was waiting for Zoom to work through its updates, there was a chipping sparrow that was also singing. Um, and these are all indications that they are still actively defending uh, their territories um, as they work through the family process. Now, chipping sparrows, uh, I'm pretty sure they're working uh, on their second broods because they started pretty early. And cardinals, they're here year round. So they might, I don't know if they might even have time for a third one, but um, they are singing as well. And I hope you can hear it. Now, now that I've said that, they've gone silent, but maybe we'll get a little bit more accompaniment as the evening goes on. What I'm not hearing, and it probably has to do with that really hard rain we had a couple hours ago, are the cicadas. Uh, that's part of what we're gonna talk about tonight is uh, who is starting to uh, sing that's that's not a bird. Um, so we're gonna uh, review our cicada species. And I was really hoping that we would have some accompaniment by them, but I have a feeling um, <laughs> the rain has them, uh, you know, knocking the water out of their timbles and, you know, trying to, get uh, get reoriented. Um, but we certainly need the rain and humidity is always good for birds. I always say if it's muggy, then it's buggy. Um, that's the really important part of insect life. Um, I actually put this jacket on that because it's, it is a little cooler out, but um, we've been having some little biting gnats around these last few days and I don't want to get it up. So uh, anyway, let's go ahead and get started with uh, some slides that are, uh, well, they're part of the, uh, the outreach uh, that we're doing this month to uh, local retirement communities. But uh, I think let's see if I can remember how to do a screen share here. I'm going to optimize uh, for video and uh, I'm gonna share um, this. So let's see. Um, let's talk 
uh, first of all, about insects that don't make noise, but are also uh, going through with their uh, courting and um, uh, what comes after courting so that we get more fireflies next year. Um, these guys have been appearing since, uh, they, they seem to pop up a little later this year and I really think that has to do, I've been hearing two things. One, they were late and two, there's not as many. And I, I think that is because of the dry weather that we had. Um, this is an insect, we all know it really well by its adult form, like this one here. This was on a, just to give you a little perspective, this is a, um, a tiny little firefly that we have in this area. I believe the species, and none of these things seem to have very common um, or, or have common names. Uh, we just call them all generically, you know, fireflies or lightning bugs, but we do have, I would say at least three different species around here. This one, so this is a blade of reed canary grass. Um, and this firefly was about half, um, its body length was about half the uh, the width of a blade of reed canary grass. So we're talking, um, you know, maybe a centimeter or so, uh, maybe a half an inch in length. Uh, Marginellus is the species name. It's actually part of a, a complex uh, of two different species that are really hard to tell apart. But just I always think of them as the, the tiny ones. Um, that's going to be important in a couple other slides, but before we get to that, I wanted to show you, uh, I think I've showed this clip before, but it's really helpful to understand um, if you are seeing fewer fly fireflies and uh, you um, are in an area that uh, has been very dry, which is uh, most of us, um, this is how fireflies start off. They are in the ground. Um, or under, this was actually under a log over at uh, Del Nor Woods. I had rolled it uh, when I was looking for something else that I don't even remember because I got so excited when I saw this young, uh, this firefly larva here. Now as beetles, they go through complete metamorphosis. So they start out as an egg and then they go to a larval stage and then they, they pupate and then they come out as an adult. So this is the firefly in the larval stage. I believe this was in late April or early May. Um, let's watch what it does here. Um, it's kind of a, a secret life of fireflies thing we're gonna look at here because um, we think of them as you know gentle and fairy-like as they fly around, but um, they're actually uh, predators in this, this early stage of life. You can see uh, up front as the creature moves along, it's got, oh, it's encountering some other creatures, uh, but it's got some uh, chewing mouth parts there and it is going to, it's going to stick them into that worm. That worm is, is not looking very healthy and I kind of wonder if maybe this larva had uh, been feeding on it over on this side too. If you've ever kept worms, uh, you know, say if you're going fishing or something and maybe you, you uh, keep them a little too long or they get too warm, um, they can start to look kind of sad like this. Their segments get pinched and they don't look very good. Um, this one though uh, clearly was still edible and here's our, our firefly larva going in. Um, for another delicious bite. So they, they have this part of their life, uh, one to two years is where they are to be found in that early stage. As an adult, once they, so pupation takes, uh, I think about three or four weeks. Uh, and when they, when they emerge as an adult, then just as is the case with just about all of our insects, that life, that final adult stage is is really short compared to um, the other part, the uh, the early part. Um, you know, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, it'll kind of depend on um, how much rain and, and humidity we have, how long the adults will last. Um, there's even disagreement um, as to how much they feed as adults. I think it's becoming more accepted that they do feed on nectar. Um, and there is a notable exception to that too, which we're going to get to. Um, but this is all 
leading up to uh, the the courtship uh, that we're seeing right now as the adult flyer, fireflies um, are flashing in species specific patterns to each other. Um, if you watch really carefully uh, in your yards or if you go to a local park or forest preserve, you're gonna see that there are different um, flash patterns depending on the species. And as I said, we've got uh, more or less three different types around here. We've got the, the small, the marginals who has a, a kind of a rapid burst of light that it flashes. Um, we have the um, Botanus pyralis, which is the um, the most common species. It's some people call it the lawn firefly or the lawn lightning bug because um, they are not fussy about their habitat and they live in a lot of lawns. They um, light up in what's known as a J for the males. They they start off low and and end high in a sort of a J sweeping J. Um, and then we have our um, uh, Photurus, uh, the genus, I'm drawing a blank on what the species is, but that's our largest one. So it's kind of like the three bears. We've got a small, we've got a medium, we've got a large. Uh, the Photurus species, um, that has a uh, kind of a crescendo light. It starts low, uh, you know, starts out um, slow and gets brighter and then dims again, um, usually in, in one spot. Now, um, when I mentioned the the pyralis, the, the lawn fireflies, when they're flying and they make that J stroke, when when a firefly is in flight, um, especially at at night when they're courting, there's a real good chance if it's mobile like that, it's a male. Um, if it's sitting still, uh, you see it on the end of a twig, um, a, a leaf, uh, a trail. <laughs> um, they there's a real good chance that that's a female. The females watch as males uh, fly around. And then when they see uh, a male that's flashing in an appealing and species specific way, they will signal back to him. He will fly down to her. Uh, they go on a date and that's how we get more fireflies. But uh, whenever we talk about insects, you can always count on drama and intrigue and fireflies are no different. Um, this, so this is our largest species. This was a picture I took on uh, some goldenrod. Uh, it's, it's hard to tell because again, I didn't put the lip on there and I don't know what this little doodle right here is, if that could possibly be an egg. I sort of thought they laid their eggs on the ground. So maybe, I don't know, maybe she had to go potty. Uh, I don't know what that is, but that's what actually caught my eye. Um, and that's why I ended up taking the picture.
Hey, Pam, you're muted. So you didn't hear all that babbling. <laughs> How's that? Is that better? Thank you. Um, so um, Potorus females, uh, and there are several different species, um, only one of which we have in this area, but the, the Potorus females are known as femme fatales um, because of what they do to those little um, smaller species of firefly in our area, it's the marginalis males. So um, as we said, this is a type of firefly that has uh, for its own species, it has a glow that it's a crescendo that uh, starts low and builds and then goes dim again. Um, she, however, can imitate the flashes of other species, including our little buddy, um, Marginellis, uh, who is, uh, she is, I would say three quarters of an inch and he is um, less than half an inch. So she will flash when she sees a, um, a little uh, Marginellis flying by, she can flash in his pattern. And when he flies in to take a look, she gets him. Um, there's there's um, been a lot of discussion in the entomological circles about why she would do such a thing because um, it's uh, commonly accepted that they're only predators in the larval stage. Well, um, recent research has identified some chemicals. They're a, a, a steroid compounds. They're called, I'm going to look this up. I think it's uh, lucibufagans. Um, that doesn't really roll off the tongue, does it? Um, but it um, it's it's a steroid that's that's um, bitter tasting. It it makes the fireflies unappealing, while these smaller photinus um, fireflies have that chemical. These larger photurus fireflies do not. So the thinking is that she acquires that chemical and then is better able to repel predators like spiders, uh, possibly birds. Um, but I, the other thing I like about this photo, um, and which by the way, I did not take and I see, I don't have a photo credit. <laughs> apologize for me and thank them because it just it shows how um yeah we're unstable it shows how huge the eyes are on the uh and fireflies in general their whole perpetuation of their species relies on them being able to see each other so uh, having big eyes is very important um, just like with um, our frogs, the male frogs have big ears because they've got to hear what their competition is. So, um, yeah, keep your eyes open. Um, I'd appreciate hearing from you if you think you're seeing more fireflies than usual or less fireflies than usual or about the same number of fireflies that you would expect. But they are here and they will be uh, doing their thing for a few more weeks now. They usually start to die back as we get into August. So now's the time if you want to get out and see them. Now, um, it is also, well, I had a funny little pun up here. Um, I'm gonna move this down. It's time for cicadas. <laughs> um, I took this picture last summer when I had the good fortune to have a cicada land right by my watch. Um, and I knew I'd be able to use it in a slideshow. <laughs> so um, this is uh, an insect that we are hearing as well, um, that uh, also, they're mating right now, but they also start their life cycle in the ground, but for a much longer period of time. Fireflies, one to two years, cicadas, uh, I'm sorry, one to two years for fireflies, cicadas, two to five years. Um, there's That's quite a range, and I think some of it might depend on species. I think some of it might depend on weather and temperature and, and things like that, as well as food source, which for these guys is um, the fluids that are in tree roots. So they, they um, when they're, uh, the female lays eggs, uh, she will deposit them. She'll make little slits on the ends of tree branches. 
when those eggs hatch, the, the tiny, tiny nymphs fall down to the ground and they immediately start to dig into the soil and they latch onto an available root. Um, over the course of that two to five years, they, they're continually feeding. They've got a, a piercing and sucking mouth part that they, they push into a root. They feed on those, those juices. Uh, they grow, they shed their skin, they grow some more, they shed their skin, on and on until, I want to say it's five molts that they go through. Now, this one I accidentally dug up when I was uh, moving some wild ginger around. So we've got our wild ginger here. And we've got our cicada here. You can see the wing pads on the back. I, I think this one was probably coming up towards the surface. This was not this year's photo. This was from a couple of years ago in, I want to say, uh, June, late May or June. Um, look at these uh, front legs. They are made for digging. They've got those sharp claws. Uh, on the front, and they've got that Popeye-like thickness that lets them uh, claw through the dirt, through the, sorry, through the soil to find uh, the roots that they need to feed on. And then they claw their way up through the soil so that they can um, have their last molt, um, shed their skin, they, they leave these shells, um, they split right here when they come out and emerge as adults. I thought this was a, a pretty cool shot um, showing the uh, soon to be eyes uh, and the, um, I think that's some dirt there. Anyway, the, there's lots of these cicadas that are now just below the soil um, getting ready to emerge. And when they do, they make their way to a uh, vertical surface um, usually a tree, but sometimes a, a house or um, a, a, a pole. I found one one time on the um, a stop sign pole. So you know whatever they they can find to to grip onto to climb up. You can see this one still has some some soil on its head, um, stride out, but it's moving up, uh, making its way to a point where it can then. Uh, split that skin one more time and whoop, pop out those um, um, wings will start to fill with fluid and um, we have an adult cicada. Now, um, in our area, uh, we're starting to hear them singing. I, usually around July 1st is when we hear our first cicada here in Northeastern Illinois. Um, this year, I heard my first one on July 3rd. Um, maybe I missed them on the first and the second, but it, it's you know, early July is when we start to hear these songs. Now, unlike our grasshoppers and our crickets and our katydids, which are rubbing wings or legs together, um, the cicadas actually use these structures here on the side of their body. These are uh, some flexible ribs called. Uh, the timbals, there's one on either side of the body. And um, the male will pull them in and out very, very rapidly. And they make a, like a, a popping sound. Uh, if you can picture like, a, you know, when you open a, a jar and it's vacuum sealed and that little button in the middle pops up. And then if you push it in and out, it makes a, you know, a clicking sound, do that like a bunch of times a second, you know, dozens of times, hundreds of times a second, as fast as you, well, you probably can't do it that fast, not as fast as these guys can, but the, the, that's the way they make that sound. They pop these flexible ribs in and out, in and out, in and out, and it makes um, a, a species specific uh, sound. Now, um, here we've got what's probably our most common species. I'm not going to focus on the visual characteristics because um, they're they're a little hard to tell apart, at least to my eye. But they're very distinctive in terms of what they sound like. Um, I'm going to see if we can get okay. Hopefully, they're hearing it. 
that is, um, some people call it the salt shaker sound. Um, I think it sounds like a lawn sprinkler. Uh, but I remember the name of the cicada. Linnaeus is after uh, Carl Linnaeus. I always remember that name by thinking that Linnaeus, Linnaeus liked salt. I don't know if he did or not, but it helps me remember. Now I'm going to move this pesky black bar up again so you can see that um, they are likely to call all day long. That's important because not every species has the same um, day part that it chooses to be active in. If we look, uh, for instance, at our next species, which is the dog day cicada, um, this one uh, sings mainly afternoon and can extend on into dusk. I, I love all the, the variety, the diversity of cicadas that we have, but of these four, this is the one that, eh, it's a little, mm, get on your nerves. Um, it's a, a whiny buzz, um, might sound like a, a power tool. It might sound like a dentist drill, um, neither of which are terribly pleasant. I have a, a connection to this sound that goes back to my days at um, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, go Illini, uh, sitting on the third floor of Lincoln Hall in a, uh, I think it was an English class of some sort, and it was so hot because there was no air conditioning, we had the windows open. I was not listening at all to the, I forget if it was a professor or a TA who was speaking, um, I don't even remember what course it was, but I do remember listening to the cicadas droning out there on the quad. So the dog day cicada, I've not heard these yet. They might uh, still be uh, getting ready to start singing. I've definitely heard the Linnaeus. And I believe I have heard a few of these guys too. Very distinctive song here with the scissor grinder cicada. If you can picture uh, a grinding wheel going around and around and around. This is very uh, readily identifiable by that sound. Um, this is one that had we not had the hard rain, we might still be hearing right now. They will go right up until um, the night chorus uh, starts. So as we get into later July and our Katie dids um, and crickets are singing, um, the, the this day shift of the cicadas will shut down and the night shift of the uh, crickets and Katie dids will start up. This guy's one of the late ones. Um, and we've got the lyric cicada, and I don't know how that became the common name because um, lyric is not, oops, lyric is not what I hear. I hear um, a loose part. To me, it seems like it's something's rattling or is loose, needs to be bolted down. This call is distinctive for its length. These guys have been known to sing for up to a minute. This is one too that um, is an early morning cicada. Uh, I remember speaking to a Breakfast Rotary here in St. Charles a few years ago and um, meeting started at seven and there were no cicadas singing at seven, but when we left the meeting at eight, they had already started up. So if you hear a, a morning buzz, <laughs> if you hear the buzz, <laughs> If you hear a cicada in the morning, chances are it's a lyric cicada. Now, did a little whoopsie there. You saw what's coming. Um, we are now in our countdown to brood 13. But remember a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that I'd heard um, the uh, periodical cicada. I'd heard one uh, across the street here. Um, these are uh, coming. Uh, I think they're, they're pretty much done. When we do have our uh, brood 13 emergence next year. Um, here in St. Charles, it was kind of lackluster, um, bordering on disappointing. Uh, a lot of our town was built up um, 
in ways that didn't conserve trees. And, and there were large areas that didn't have trees. Um, remember trees are essential for these guys to feed on and spending 17 years in the ground, um, if that, uh, over that 17 year period, if that soil is disturbed, dug up, if trees are cut down, it's going to affect the populations. Um, further east from here, um, uh, Glen Ellen, Lombard, Villa Park, um, and then uh, Oak Park, very large um, cicada populations in those those older and um, towns that developed earlier. So uh, be prepared as we get into 2024, there'll probably be a, a bit of a buildup. Um, and again, rather than July, like our annual cicadas, this periodical cicadas tend to um, be seen and heard in our area in June. So uh, the countdown has begun. Okay, tell you what, let's um let's get out of this and um, might as well go to uh, some chats. I'm going to end the screen share for now and um, uh, let's see, tackle a couple of chats here. Um, <laughs> So uh, yeah, we had a little technical difficulty there. Um, hopefully things are running more smoothly now. Um, okay, so 75% of last year's firefight population slowly declining every year. 30% um, of the usual crowd. Yeah, so um, some of it's drought, some of it too. In um, this, These are night flying insects and um, we still have folks, we have neighbors, we have uh, people that think that nighttime is the time to, to spray for um, mosquitoes, even though, guys, we've had, I don't even know if I've gotten a mosquito bite this summer. Uh, except for one, one night I was up at Otter Creek in the marsh <laughs> where the mosquitoes live, and I got a couple of bites. But yeah, we've had a very uh, mosquito-free summer, but um, some of the chemicals that are sprayed for mosquitoes can affect the fireflies. So too, though, can um, things that are applied to the soil. Because remember, it's that um, larval stage where they're there for one to two years. So uh, whether it's it's fertilizers, uh, weed killers, uh, whatever um, is applied to soil, that can very much also be affecting our firefly populations. Um, Fire, uh, frog monitoring a few nights ago there was a good amount of fireflies but less than i would have expected yeah um uh, oh boy you know frog monitoring i was going to bring up uh we were going to do a little thing on frogs tonight and i forgot to get that loaded in it's on on my phone so we'll have to delay that till next week but the the rain um you know those of you um who are frog monitors um you know that the frog monitoring season has now concluded in a typical year, there are three distinct monitoring periods for those of you who aren't frog monitors. Um, it starts in, um, gosh, late February, early March, when the, uh, the, the little species like the, uh, the spring peeper and uh, chorus frog, sometimes there's even still snow and, and ice out there when they get uh, heading to their breeding ponds. Um, well, because we had that drought through much of May and June, um, a lot of frogs and our toads too have, have kicked it up again. I um, I was doing a program today down at the homestead in Batavia and uh, someone played a recording for me from the that they made two nights ago on their balcony and it was um, tree frogs. Uh, I kind of think they might be Eastern Tree frogs. I want to send them send that recording in to see because um, th there's two species of gray tree frogs here in Kane County. The co or take that back. For years, we only heard one species of gray tree frog in Kane County, the Cope's gray tree frog. But this year, uh, we've had a couple of monitors report hearing eastern gray tree frogs. In this recording on my phone, sounds like one too. Um, all right, I'm getting way off course. We'll get back to frogs next week, but um, yeah, the, the uh, just you know, bringing water back into uh, the scene is really uh, 
helped a lot of creatures, not just our insects, but our frogs too. Okay, um, let's see, it's already 20 to nine. I've got a few slides I wanted to show you of uh, nature from this past week. So let's see if I can get those pulled up. Um, <laughs> pick a screen, any screen. And now I'm going to pull this pesky black bar down out of the way again. And we're going to go here. So, um, you know, a weird little bunch of things um, that uh, close this out. Um, I wanted to share with you, going back actually to when we met two weeks ago, or maybe this was even three weeks ago. This was a photo uh, taken, Kim, I don't know if you're on tonight. Um, this was at Johnson's Mound. This is a Dick Newman wasp. And I wanted to tell you guys, I misspoke when I said that the Ick Newman, um, she's got this long ovipositor. This is a female and she uses this. She can actually sense um, the the chewing and the um, the movement of larvae that are in uh usually dead wood um and what i said at the time was wood boring beetles well it turns out this species of ichneumon wasp actually specializes in the larvae of these guys here which are horntails um they look like they could give you quite a sting but uh this is their ovipositor um, these are sometimes called wood wasps because they deposit their uh, eggs in dead wood. So they're often found around um, trees, <laughs> wood. Uh, this was actually, this was up at Otter Creek Bend a few years ago. Um, those are actually my waders in the background. This was down by the creek up there. But um, that Ichneumon specializes in um, controlling the population of these guys. Um, but I just wanted to make sure we were clear there and we didn't have any misunderstandings. Um, if we go on to the next slide. So, um, oh, you know what? This is out of order. Let's go to the next one. We're going to have to come back to that one because um, everything was pixelated when I threw that one in at the last minute. That is actually, you know what? I'll address it now and then we'll refer back to it. This is a... Um, multicolored Asian lady beetle. This is the one of several species of uh, ladybugs that's been introduced. The color, highly variable. It can be orange like this. It can be a deeper red. It can be almost yellow. It can have a few spots like this one does. It can have no spots. It can have lots of spots. So all the pattern and color and everything is very variable. Right here though, this, this area that, uh, this plate that appears is over the head and uh, the thorax. It's called the pronotum. And it's got, um, well, from this angle, it looks like a W, but you lo look at it from the other way and it's an M for multicolored Asian lady beetle. Keep that in mind because we're going to get back to ladybugs <laughs> in a few slides. Sorry about that. Um, this was a, uh, a uh, wasp uh, photo sent in the reader was wondering uh, what species it was i'm pretty sure it's our northern paper wasp which is the uh, the most common species that we see in this area but what i thought was pretty cool was it has curly antennae and and a lot of our uh, paper wasps um you look you see that longer curlier antenna and you know you're looking at a male um it's the, the females in these colonies that do a lot of the work males exist to mate with um future queens, but I thought it was kind of cool. It was such a great example of those curly antennae on this fella. It's a handy tip you can use the next time you see a wasp, see if it's a boy or a girl. Um, now this, since our internet is a little wonky, I'm not sure how well this is going to play, but this is a young um, red-tailed hawk. And I put this in because young red-tailed hawks are very vis visible and very vocal right now. Um, yeah, I don't know that this is going to work. Um, it was just kind of, you know, moving its head back and forth. Uh, we oftentimes when we do owl programs at the Nature Center, um, we talk about how owls' eyes are fixed in their head. That's true, actually, of of 
of most birds. They, they can't move their eyes from side to side the way we can. So when they need to get um, you know, a different view of something, they have to, to move their head around. It's a very um, birdie kind of a, a move that they make when they're trying to focus on something which we can't see. Um, I'm just gonna move on because that's not gonna work. Um, this, was, this was kind of a cool thing that was sent in by um, a reader who lives in the town of, I think it's Milledgeville. Um, and they were seeing um, some of their cone flowers. They have a, a, a large, um, uh, they, they've, they've got farmland, but they've got a large portion of it in um, a conservation program. And they've planted it in, uh, uh, they've seeded it with a, a lot of um, prairie flowers. And these are black-eyed Susans, but there's a fair number of them that have this, this sort of inside out look to them. And this is, um, I did, uh, Kind of a, a deep dive into this and, and came out knowing less than when I started. <laughs> um, fasci fasciation is what it's called. So picture the word fascination and then take the N out. So fasciation, um, it's defined as a malformation of plant stems. Um, uh, it's um, there, it's it's considered um, um a, a visual um an aesthetic issue now some people actually think these things are kind of cool and there are some ornamental plants that are grown for this trait like the the coxcomb flowers that you can buy as annuals uh at the store um there's thought to be multiple causes for this condition but there is a bacterium, uh, Rhodococcus fasciens, um, causes at least some of the infectious cases of this condition. Um, there's some viruses that can also cause this to occur. Um, it says to help prevent the spread and damage uh, caused by the bacteria. Um, avoid injuring plants, um, such as by excessive pruning, especially when the plants are wet. So you, you don't want to spread the uh, the bacteria around. Um, it can also be caused by genetic conditions. Um, it says to prune off and dispose of distorted tissue. Do not propagate or graft symptomatic plants. Clean all your tools after clipping off fasciated plant parts. Well, it was just a, kind of a, a cool thing. He actually, um, the reader thought that it was, um, you know, worth, and, and I, maybe they picked these flowers and brought them into their house. I'm not sure, but it um, it is something I've never seen it before. But um, it is something that can occur in an arrayed flower like a, um, a black-eyed Susan. It makes a kind of a cool looking variation almost looks like a double um, flower head on the end of that stem fasciation now here we have um, a, a bee bomb uh, this is a monarda fistulosa this is our our native uh, monarda bee balm species that we have in this area aren't these it's the coolest looking flower heads i just i was looking at them the other day and i thought that this is um this is a, a species of flower that's considered a pioneer species. It, it um, propagates readily. It's often one of the first prairie plants that blooms in a prairie restoration. Um, I'm less hopeful of the next slide because it's a um, video. Since the first one didn't work, I'm not sure this one is either, but I was watching a bumblebee visiting um the flowers of the bee balm uh yeah it's all pixelated um but it's sticking its tongue inside each little petal which is like a tube shoot i wish this oh there's a little bit clearer <laughs> that's done <laughs> tell you what let's go back 
here I can show you here. See how each one of these um, petal structures has is a tube? That's where the bees come and feed. And that's where uh, bees who have a longer tongue are at an advantage as they go in and sip the nectar from these blossoms. It was really cool. I've, um, again, it's called bee balm. It's actually uh, bergamot is what some other people call it. And you can make tea that tastes kind of like Earl Grey tea for if you use the dried leaves. Um, but I never really watched how insects visit these blossoms, but it's these tubes right here. Pretty neat. And yeah, we're not going to try that again. And that's this. Um, this was um, a milkweed uh, in my yard, and it had holes in the stem. Um, I've never seen holes in the stem of a milkweed before. Maybe I just haven't paid close enough attention, but we always hear about the um, the toxic components in milkweed sap. And yet here we have something that clearly seems to be able to tolerate it. It's not the work of a, a milkweed caterpillar, uh, sorry, monarch caterpillar, that's for sure. Um, and I don't think it's the work of milkweed beetles or milkweed bugs. I think it is um, the work of um, these species here, let's see, we're gonna go back. Um, there are some weevils that actually will bore into the stems of milkweed. Um, I wasn't able to tell you what, um, here, this is an extension, U of I extension newsletter. It talks about milkweed weevils. Um, they describe um, one species, Lineaticolis, uh, that um, bores into the stems of um, Asclepias syriaca, which is our common milkweed. Um, and they say in this uh, little newsletter that um, they lay eggs in the stem near the base of the plant, um, chewing a series of holes, a vertical series of holes. Well, the damage that I saw was at the top of the plant, which in this article they say is done by a separate species, anectens, uh, which Bug Guide says this is a misspelling. It's this species should be A-N-N-E-C-T-E-N-S. Um, they um, drill holes near the top of the plant, but it's on swamp milkweed, not common milkweed. So here's a look at what these guys look like. Uh, I'm gonna look, I don't have a whole lot of milkweed this year, but I'm gonna look at what's out there. Um, this picture that I have, this was a very small plant. Um, and yeah, the, the, the top was all wilty. And then um, if we zoom in here, we can see where the holes were right here. Uh, so I'll keep an eye out for more. And if you guys see the work of milk, Asian, that we had just seen the picture of the multicolored Asian lady beetle, okay, with the M. Uh oh, we're unstable again. Um, with the M on the pronotum. Well, this is something, um, and we're seeing a lot of these right now, this orange blob on the sleeve. This is the pupa of a multicolored Asian lady beetle. Um, so it, again, it's a beetle. So it starts out as an egg, and then it's a larva, and then it's a pupa. Um, this the, the larva, and shoot, why didn't I put a picture of the larva in? They are black. They look, they always, for some reason, kind of remind me of six-legged alligators. They're very rough looking. They're black with orange markings on them. Um, kind of pinchy. Um, their job is to eat other insects, uh, especially aphids. Um, but if you see an orange blob like this, we can actually, if we zoom in, you can see uh, where it, um, there's, there's, 
when it it molted into this pupal stage, you can see uh, the remnants of its larval skin at the base here. As um, uh, an adult, uh, I think pupation for these guys is, I don't know, a couple of weeks. Uh, they come out as uh, an adult ladybug. They, uh, males and the females get together, they lay eggs, the cycle starts again. But um, I get questions about this from people who look at it. And they, it's, in some ways, it looks kind of like a gall or some other kind of growth on the leaf, but because uh, they don't move at this stage. It's the pupa of a Asian ladybug. Now, speaking of imports, um, I ran into this ladybug the other day, and I always get excited. If I if there's no M on the pronotum, I get excited because for so long, the Asian species has been the dominant species in this area. And so um, it's kind of a little nerdy hobby I have to see um, if they might be a native. So I saw this one the other day. This was up at Raceway Woods Forest Preserve, which is up, it's right, uh, right on the border between Dundee and Carpentersville. And it was an actual racetrack back in the 60s. There's some interesting signage up there explaining the history of the property. Now it's um, used quite heavily by mountain bikers and they hold mountain bike races there. Uh, but it's got a nice, mostly paved uh, path that goes around the, the perimeter. Um, of the parcel. Um, I was there uh, with tech support puppy. We're getting, uh, we're still working on our manners. And um, we stopped with our, we were in the midst of a pack walk with our trainer and some other dogs in class. And when we stopped for a water break, I saw this, uh, this ladybug and it doesn't have an M. It's got one, two, three, four, and if we look at the back of it, so there's one, two, three, four spots, five, six, seven. It's a seven-spotted ladybug. Now, it's um, it's not a native species. Um, do we have one more? Yeah. Um, it's it's not native. It is brought. It was another uh, one of the ladybugs that was brought to this country for um, biological insect control. And um, the first, I think it was the on purpose, if I remember correctly, the on purpose introductions did not take, but then an accidental did take. And so this species has now spread widely. Um, and it, I don't know, it just, it was just kind of cool to see something that was not uh, the Asian lady beetle. Um, there seems to be a, a strong population. Uh, more Asian lady, a uh, seven spotted European ladybug without an M on its pronotum. So, just a quick thing made me happy to see, and we hear so many stories of you know, humans being bad, uh, you know, if someone stops to let a turtle cross the road and somebody else zooms around them and runs the turtle over, somebody stops for geese and somebody zooms around and runs the geese over. Well, in this case, this is Route 64. This is out by um, our lovely Pheasant Run Tower. This is heading east the other day. Um, this huge group, this was uh, mamas and papas and all kinds of babies. I would say there were at least... 25 geese, uh, maybe more than that. And you can see the the westbound traffic had stopped. The eastbound traffic stopped too. Nobody was a jerk. Nobody hurt the geese. The geese made it safely over here to uh, the south side of the road. And life went on. It was just kind of an uplifting thing. I guess I'm easily uplifted but it was I was happy to see that they all made it across and nobody was honking nobody was you know being mean to the geese um I um appreciated it and I bet you the geese did too all right one more quick thing this um this was uh late breaking in nature news from this morning I was <laughs> changing the water in the bird bath like I do every day. And I fished out a, um, a long-legged fly. 
and it was still alive. It dried its wings and it flew away. Well, while I was watching that long-legged fly, apparently another one fell in the water, but it did not survive. So I, I took the opportunity to, I tried doing, um, my friend Nikki, sometime we'll have to have her on as a guest. Um, she's a, a big champion of insects. She actually can do um, insect CPR. If one falls into her pool, she had rescued a wall like that last year. If you press very, very gently on their abdomen, which is where their spiracles are, insects don't breathe through their mouths. They have um, a different sort of uh, system where they have holes in their abdomen where air is brought in and out. Um, this one I, I tried to do CPR on and, and it, it, it didn't work. The insect did not survive. They're predatory flies. They like to hang out by um, the compost, which is the bird bath. I took the upper some close-up shots. I wanted to see if we could look at um, this little structure right here. So this is a fly and flies are in the order diptera, which um, means two wings, di for die for two and terra for wings, diptera. Um, in place of the other set of wings, they have these little structures. And this is true of, of pretty much all flies. It's just, it's easier to see on some flies than others. It's really tall tiers on uh, there. They almost look like little uh, batons sticking out. Uh, they're, they're, they're in the location where the back or the hind wings would be. So I was trying to get a picture of the, uh, the hall tiers on this little insect. This was um, pretty small, I would say a centimeter or less. Um, but as I was doing that, um, we got photobombed. Can you see who's coming in over here? It was an ant um, that did not want to pass up the opportunity for uh, a free lunch. So uh, the ant moved in. I think I better wind this up before we we lose our connection again. Um, I did have a couple more slides. We were going to talk about daddy long legs, but it is after nine o'clock. So um, I think we'll just save those for next week. And in the meantime, um, oh, all the chats that were there are gone. Um, well, this is awkward. I guess this is where we say, uh, thanks again for tuning in. If anybody has anything they'd like to share quickly and uh, either want to say it 
um, verbally or, or tap it out in a chat, feel free to do. Thank you, Pam. <laughs> You're gone again. <laughs> Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Good night. Good night, Pam. Hi, Pam. Hi, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Thank you, Pam. Good night. Bye, Pam. Pam. There we go. We're just going to call it a night before this goes completely down the drain. I <laughs> uh, appreciate your time, everybody. Have a great rest of your week. Um, and we'll see you back again next week for more good nature. Have a good one.